Good morning and happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School with the Hampton Roads, Chesapeake, and Western Branch Seventh-day Adventist Churches, where this week we are studying education in arts and sciences. But before we get started, we will have our prayer, um, and we're always open for prayer requests because we do believe in the power of prayer. So does anyone have prayer requests this morning? Yes, um, I would like and, um, all of you to pray for me, for my family. As, as you are doing, and I want to thank you so much for your prayers, but also there are several individuals right now, they need prayer. We need to pray to continue praying for our Cora. She has some challenges uh, and we need uh, to pray for her. And there are several other individuals, Ethel Burton, um, Billy, Charles, and many other people that they need our prayer. And Ursula also today, uh, she was in Williamsburg. She was transferred to Williamsburg because they don't have more places in the hospital for her here. So she needs our prayers. So, yes. Awesome. And I would ask that we pray for um, one of my friends, Cheryl. She had surgery and then was back in the hospital. She's now home. So we are grateful that she is home. We're praising God for that. We just continue to pray for her healing as time progresses. Okay. And pray for those who the little day-to-day -day things in life is wearing them down and is a trial for them. Mm -hmm. All right, any other prayer requests this morning? I think also for our churches in general. For the leadership, for the unity of the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If some of you, those who are watching us, you have a prayer request, please don't hesitate to contact us and we will be happy to talk to pray for you uh, online um, and also personally. All right. And if we have no other prayer requests, we'll ask Pastor Stoyan to pray for our prayer request and to provide us with opening prayer for us out of school. Yes, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this Sabbath because, Lord, we found rest in you. And Lord, there are so many other things, Lord, happening in our lives that um, many times we are concerned about the future, about present. So Lord, we are asking you in this moment to take our lives in your hands. Right now, Lord, there are several individuals that they need your attention. And you know, the Lord, you know them by name. And I know that you are the only one that you can, who can help them. Lord, it's about Alcora. She needs your help. She's still in the hospital. And Lord, she needs you. And also for Billy Charles, Lord, for Sister Ursula, for Ethel Burton, for um, many other individuals that are sick right now, Lord. And also we praise your name for Cheryl because you are listening to our prayers. And we see, Lord, happening miracles in the life of those people who we are lifting up in prayer. So, Lord, we know that you are listening to our prayer. We call your name and we thank you so much for uh, solving our problems, especially those for those people who right now they struggle financially. I am asking you, Lord, to bless them, to give them peace, to give them, Lord, uh, rest in you, and to know for sure, to feel your presence, that you are there. Give them hope, Lord, and be with them. Be with all of those people right now who are listening to our Sabbath school, those who have prayer requests, unspoken prayer requests. I know, Lord, that uh, right now we, they, they join us in prayer. You promise that whatever are two or three gather in your name, you will be with them. So, Lord, we know that you are answering their, their prayers also. So Lord, we thank you also for this Sabbath school. Bless us, help us to see you and to be uh, sharing your thoughts, to be used by you, so that all of those people who are listening and we, are, we also can learn from you alone. We thank you so much for the Bible study that you are right now leading individuals to you, for those who have taken the decision to be baptized. I'm asking you, Lord, to bless them for the leadership of the church that we are right now, Lord, uh, in, and also for the unity of the churches. We are asking all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much for the opening prayer. So we will go ahead and jump into our Sabbath school lesson this week, which was education in arts and sciences. And it really talked about how um, we focus, when we think about education, it is, we think about arts and science, like those are two of the place, the things we think about. And you never can, it's hard to relate how that those arts and sciences relate to the Bible, 
you know, there's some things in education where it's a clear cut. This is biblical, this is taken from here, but for arts and sciences is not as clean of a transition. So today we will look and see how we can relate the arts and sciences to the Bible. And we'll start with Sunday's lesson where it's the Lord alone. And we'll read, uh, the first passage we'll read is Romans chapter one, verses 18 through 21. I have it. Okay, go for it, Heather. Thank you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God had showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew him, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Okay, and then we'll also read Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. I have it. Okay. You're on it tonight. Go for it. <laughs> the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Okay, so when we look at both the passage in Romans and Psalms, what do these verses tell us about God as our creator? One of the first things that we notice is that Paul says that <clears throat> everybody knows about, about the fact and they know that, that we are created. Even though right now many people are denying and they reject that lie, Paul makes the uh, idea that in us, God has put his image. In other words, we cannot escape from that. Yes, we can reject it. We can refute it. We can say that God did not create it. But the more we say it, the clearer is that God has created us. Mm -hmm. uh, and many people today, they, they come to the scientists, they come to the knowledge, they come to understanding that uh, God has created. One of the scientists, his name is Anthony Flew, who is the professor of Richard Dawkins, one of the atheists that right now is the one to, the militant atheist, in other words, the one to evangelize the world to the, uh, through atheism. Uh, Anthony Flew, <clears throat> a few years ago, he became deist, he became a believer because he was studying the human DNA in trying to reject and trying to, uh, to oppose the, the creation of God, he came to the same conclusion as many others, as we also that God exists, God is created. So this is the first point that uh, the uh, Apostle, uh, Apostle Paul, Paul has mentioned that we know because it is in us, in our hearts, in our minds, in our body, we know that we are created. There is no way how, uh, because one of the reasons is the law, the Ten Commandments, for instance, you go in every single tribe, you go in every single nation. And I've been in many of the tribes, very, very remote in the Amazon River, days going by, by boat, which nobody knew about those people. They had the Ten Commandments. How did they, they, they have those Ten Commandments inside? Incredible, because the human being is exactly how Paul makes the idea, is that human being in it is coming with the software, and the software is the moral law. So the scientists today, the atheists, uh, the natural uh, individuals uh, say that uh, they cannot explain practically how the, the moral, the morality is coming from. The second point that the psalm is making is that when you look closely to a human being, uh, uh, to a, a baby, how he's born, uh, it's, it's incredible. When I was, when my son was born, was in Spain, both the nurse and the doctor they were atheists. And I asked, because when he came out from the womb, 
the first thing he did, he was to jump directly to the to the chest of my you no know, the the of his mother, and he was like smelling it, <laughs> hooking there. And I asked the doctor, after, how can you explain that if God does not exist? And he and she said it is incredible because we cannot explain the mother nature. I said how the mother nature has any has something inside the you know a milk inside? They have no idea. How, how do they go directly to the source of milk? Uh, and they said something has to exist. And I was, it was a reason for preaching for me. Every birth of my kids, I was preaching. But the other doctor with my daughter, he was a, a believer. And he said this, he said, I, my mother taught me about God, but when I began to work right now, I realize that it's a timing for every single baby. The baby is coming on time. When the baby is not coming on time, something wrong is happening. So I said, it's a perfect timing and God is the creator. So you see from the nature, we see the marvelous work that God has done. So both Paul and also David, he, he looks on, on, on all the nature and he looks on our, ourselves to identify that there is a human, there is a, a divine, creator, a divine designer. And so how do we hold on to this hope even in the midst of suffering? Because we can see that here, but like Pastor was saying, there's people around us that don't believe. And then those who may be on that line who are like, I kind of believe, but how can all of this be happening? Why would our creator allow everything that's happening in our world to happen? You know, that, that's, that's a question that comes up a lot. And um, I don't think there is any one answer that actually nails it down. I think what always comes to mind is what you told me a few years ago, Crystal, is things like that happen because this is not heaven. Mm -hmm. Right? You told me that and, and I, <laughs> it made me think, oh, yeah, that's true. This isn't heaven. <laughs> you know, everybody wants it to be perfect but everybody's perception of what perfection is, is different. Mm -hmm. And the creator, God, didn't make us all with a cookie cutter. So we're not all the same. Mm -hmm. And he has given us free will. And because we have free will and because there is sin, things will go wrong. Because I may do something wrong now that has consequences for years to come. Because when you plant one seed, you don't grow a tree with one fruit. You know, so there, there are lots of consequences to the things that we do. And God has given us choices. So we have different outcomes and different scenarios and different perception of what's going on. And, and also, Crystal, you know very well that um because of the sin, as you have said, Sister uh, Heather, because of the sin, the humanity right now, it, it is down. Uh, there is no solution for humanity, but only one, which is Jesus Christ. And you are asking about how can we have hope? You see, the only thing that stays, that remains, that it is in our opportunity is the hope. You see, in the Nazi um, time when all of all of the Jews were taken in the in the uh, the uh, how do you call it, the concentrations uh, the prisons and those places that they were so difficult the only difference made for those people who survived was that they were having hope and not yeah. only that they were hope they were having they were having hope that one day they will be out but they were they were having hope that one day they will be prosper they will go beyond and only those people they were able to move forward. The only thing we have right now when we see suffering, when we see uh, disappointment, when we see death, when we see these type of viruses coming against us, the only thing that stays and remains and, and we need to have is hope. Without the hope that will come something better and we have the promises of God that will come something better soon. Without this hope, we go nowhere and we have nothing. Uh, left, but only to despair, to lose our minds. But you see, God has given us plenty of evidence that he is with us and he will return. He will come to take us home. The closer we see the events and the, 
the, the things are coming in the world, the closer, the, the better we, we see Jesus Christ love and the better we see Jesus Christ return a need for the saved salvation of the world. So yeah, we can have, we need to have hope to look beyond our situation. It's like a pot. When you look on this pot, for instance, and you don't see anything else coming, the only one to jump out of the pot is hope, is, is, the, is the hook that is, is on the other side. And you see the prisoners in jail, they, they have the dream that one day they'll come out. Uh, any, any situation that we are in, if we do not have hope in Jesus, then we have, we have nothing left to, to live for. So let's um, move on to Monday's lesson. So we were talking about the hope here, but let's also talk about the beauty of holiness. Um, so let's read this just one verse first. We'll read Psalm 96, verse 9. Psalm chapter 96, verse 9. Okay, I have it. Okay, go for it. Worship the Lord in holy array. Tremble before him all the earth. And I have a worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. Here before him all the earth. And hold on. The other one says in all his holy splendor. Mm -hmm. So we have in wonderful array, beauty of holiness and holy splendor. What does that mean? What does it mean to worship him in the beauty of holiness or holy array or wonder, holy splendor? I think uh, with regards to this lesson, worshiping the creator and not the creation, knowing that he is holy mm -hmm. and not limiting him to our concept, our small size, not diminishing him, I should say, not diminishing him, but seeing him for the omnipotent, omnipresent God that he is. And with regards to nature and earth, worshiping him as the creator. Uh, it's in, and I go with the same, the same thought that Heather said, uh, the worship the beauty, the, the holiness. Um, it's, it's about Jesus Christ, uh, divinity and we when we see to the to his work coming here on earth we see the beauty of his his love uh, manifested to us and also in the nature in the nature as, as you know very well uh, was perfect before the sin and that was that was the the, the beautiful the beautiful holiness uh, but in the same time it's his character looking at him admiring him and how to do that it's it's very pragmatic and very pragmatic it's to look on the creation, to look, for instance, on the thing that he, he, he made it, uh, to look on Jesus Christ, to study his character, you'll find this be beautiful uh, holiness uh, of Jesus Christ. There is a passage here also in the, in the Sabbath school who I wanna read it to you. It says, study of art and science can, can add a uh, should, then draw us closer to the character and heart of God, because we are a part of God's own, own uh, artwork and scientific phenomena. We can also learn more about our own identity in Christ. And then Joy says, God will help his children appreciate his works and delight in the, in the simple, quiet beauty which, uh, with which he has adorned our earth, earthly home. Uh, he is a lover of the beautiful and above all that is uh, outwardly, attractive he loves beauty of character he would have us cultivate purity and simplicity and quiet grace of the flowers so you see god is not um is not uh, uh how do you call it um doesn't want us to suffer to see you know there are some people who believe today that the christian life has to be a sacrifice has to endure uh the pain and has to has to suffer as a Christian, when I was in the Amazon River, one of my colleagues, uh, he didn't want to come in the tent where we were, we were staying because of the mosquito, we were sleeping. He was staying outside and he was devoured by, by all the insects during the night, you know. He said, no, I have to suffer because I'm a missionary. That crap right doesn't ask us to suffer for him in this sense, to, to put ourselves in danger, 
but to live uh, and, and to enjoy life, to, to explore the beauty of, of God. Uh, the other point is also is that uh, Satan right now, he portrays himself as the ugliest with the hooves, you know, with the tail and the horns. And, and, and that picture doesn't represent God's creation. In other words, he wants us to see that everything is ugly and he is ugly. No, he's beautiful. He is still an angel of light. In other words, God, whatever God, whatever God has created is perfect. Let us enjoy of what God has done for us. Amen. So I want to look at two other verses that discuss beauty as we um, continue on Monday's lesson. So the first one is Genesis 3, 6, and the second is Proverbs 6, 25. So the first is Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And the second is Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, so this is Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Verse 6. Yes, uh, sorry, 3, verse 6, yes. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate, and she gave, uh, gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, in Proverbs 6, 25. Um, that says, don't lust after her beauty in your heart, neither let her captivate you with her eyelids. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the difference between the beauty of holiness that we were just discussing a few moments ago and earthly beauty? And what are some things that that are some beautiful things that aren't necessarily good or holy. I, I think the um, beauty of holiness with which we refer to Christ is through and through. Mm -hmm. um, it permeates everything he is. And like for the pastor said, it's his, it refers um, also to his character. Whereas earthly beauty, is as they say, only skin deep, it's surface. You know, it covers um, most times a rotten core because like, for example, now we're all captivated by the beauty of the leaves as the trees turn gold and yellow. But um, as a friend pointed out to me, we are celebrating the death of the trees. You know, it's death we're celebrating. Mm -hmm. And I think the Lord was merciful in order to give us to not let to not let the tree the leaves fall from the tree screaming in agony you know he, he made it pretty so that we could still have joy even if it's dying and i think that's what um of the worldly beauty is it's it's most times surface deep and it usually covers the wages of sin and what was the rest of your question Oh, and what are some things, some beautiful things that aren't necessarily good or holy? Kind of like the dying tree. Okay, that's it. <laughs> uh, I think God has created everything beautiful. There is nothing in this world that uh, is not created for us, but God has put some boundaries. Uh, let me share, for instance, uh, covetness, for instance, no, a law, covetness. To desire, for instance, somebody or uh, as, a, as a partner for your life is not bad. To desire to covet the food is not bad. To desire to covet the house, for instance, is not bad. It's, it's uh, in Romanian practically the word to desire, no? to, to desire that house. The problem is when you desire something that is not yours, something that is sinful, that you, you, you transgress a law. The law of God is a boundary that is putting us in a safe place. So God has created all the world beautiful, but not all that he created is for me, for you personally. In, in other words, God has said, hey, this is your boundary. You should have only one spouse. That's it, only one, not two, one. So choose the best. You have plenty of opportunity to choose the best. Now, when you choose that, do not desire something else. But you see, God has given us the possibility to desire because everything is beautiful. But when we desire something that is not ours, then 
people, they are willing to do many bad things. They are trying to kill others. They are trying to, um, to uh, transgress that law. So this happened with, uh, with Eve also. She wanted to, to eat something that God has said, hey, this is not for you. And she wanted, and she lost it. Because when you lost something that is not yours, then it's a transgression of sin, and the sin is coming. So everything is beautiful, but not all things are uh, lawful. Paul, Paul puts it this way, no? Uh, I, I, I can have everything, but if I don't have love, love for God, I have nothing. So beautiful things, if we desire those things that are not according to God's will, no matter what beautiful they are, they are turning in a, they are, they are changing us and turning us from another direction. So are not, are not good for us. And I also think that there's some things that are, that seem beautiful, but that are deceptions. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful of those as well, because what it may seem as if they are created by God, that they're, they're beautiful for us to enjoy when they're actually a deception from Satan right. to, get to lure us into something that we should not be into. So I think that's also something to be careful of when um, looking at the beauty, the earthly beauty of what our eyes can see versus, and what our eyes see as beauty and what God sees as beauty are two completely different things. And I think we have to learn the difference between the two because that vain beauty can get people into a lot of trouble. Yes, you're right, you're right. Uh, it's uh, uh, James puts it this way in the first, uh, in, in the chapter one says that when we are attracted by something, so when we are attracted by a sin for, for, for uh, about sin, for instance, when we love something that we know that that we should not go on that. So uh, Satan is, is using that pleasure and, and we are, we are right. We are giving up to that. So when we give up to that, it's, it's a sin. So yeah, there are many, many, many uh, bad things for us that we should not try. Um, and even though we like it, even though we like, for instance, eating a lot of cookies. Okay, I, I do like it, I do, but you know, right now we feel it a lot of cookies. What will happen? I had a friend, uh, I, I haven't seen him for three months. Uh, and after that, uh, he came in my office. He's from Hampton Roads and uh, I saw him. I said, hey, what happened with you? Because he was like 10 years, almost 10 years younger. And he said, no more fried chicken. That, that I'm done. So you see, even though we like cookies, we like sweets, we like, and knives are very good, are not healthy for us, you see? So you're you speaking about an example. So I think it's a good example. Yes. <laughs> so it's sweet, sweet brown sugar. <laughs> no matter how sugar. So beautiful, but so deadly. <laughs> even honey. Honey, even though it is good for your health in the small quantities, uh, is good. Uh, every that is in the excess uh, is it's damaging, no matter how good and beautiful it is. So let's look at Tuesday's lessons where we talk about experts and error. And we're going to break this one down into three parts because I feel like there was three distinct sections on this. So we'll, and they're all going to come out of 1 Timothy chapter 6. So we'll start with verses 9 through 10. It's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. I have it. Okay, go for it. Um, but those who are determined to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful lusts, such as drown men in ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Mm -hmm. Some have been led astray from the faith in their greed and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Okay. So looking at these first two verses, what warning is Paul giving in these texts? About money. Not loving money because it's the root of all evils. And it's, it's true that this, this concept comes against the concept of the time, uh, comes against the concept of the business people. Um, the, all, the majority of the business people, and I was reading a few books, they say the first thing that you have to do is to love money. It's nothing bad to love money. You know, when you love money, you cannot be divided. Loving money and loving Jesus. You have to love Jesus. When you love Jesus, the money can be a support 
for his cause, but not opposite. I know to use the money and, and know to be with God also half half and to use God to be uh, blessed, to use God to be healthy and to be wealthy. You see, many people are doing the same, to, are doing this. Uh, they have the mega churches, the prosperity gospel. We are using God to be rich. So the focus we, we have to be and to have is love God, dot, no other thing. And all the other things God has said, it will be added to you, will add it to you. But if you shift the view and you love the money, you have nothing. And many people are chasing money today and they are still poor and they are still miserable and they do not turn back. Okay, and it's difficult to convince them because they are blind. So the money, they blind you as this power. So let's all be careful with that. Yeah, I, I think um, what the pastor says is true. The, if we don't put God first, no matter what we love before God, it can be detrimental to us because a poor person may not be um, lusting after money, but they have something else that they put ahead of, of Jesus Christ and that's detrimental to them. And a rich person, they could be as rich as Croesus and not really lusting after money, but if they have anything else before Christ, it's still a root of evil for them. But since money makes this world go wrong, most people pander to money. I was reading um, Ellen G. White yesterday, um, the book uh, Parables. Uh, I, I forget about the name in English, but she speaks about the talents in that, in that parable. And she explains the fact that the rich people, they cannot sleep night because of the richness. And they, cannot, they don't have a rest uh, because they are concerned about the money, where they to go, who is stealing them. I have a case in my mind from my country. He was very, very rich, but he was living with bills. He was literally could not sleep. The more money you have, believing that you will achieve peace, believing that you will achieve rest, believing that you will achieve happiness and joy, uh, it is it is taking you down it and, and and it lets you with nothing. It was a point of my life when I when I was a businessman and I know what I'm talking about. This is why I left completely from the church because I believe that the money is the secret. And I had a lot of money. I was people. I had people working for me, but all of a sudden I saw myself uh, empty, void, no happiness, no joy. So I reached one of the stage of the of the of the desire of, of individuals. And when I reached that uh, pinnacle, uh, was nothing, was nothing. So this is, and, and, the, and the, the crazy, the beautiful thing is that right now you can have Jesus and you can have everything. You don't need the money. You don't need um, uh, material stuff. You don't need something to, to motivate, to push you to be happy. It's only one person, Jesus. And then when you have Jesus in your heart, no matter how much money you have, no matter how much things you have, you are happy. You are happy. So the secret is happiness, not the money. And so if we look at verses 11 and 12, let's, let's move on to those two verses. And this, I'm sorry, First Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 12. And I actually have it here. Um, so, but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So what should we really be focused on? I think... One of the things that we need to focus and the only thing that we need to focus is how to be closer to Jesus Christ, how to invest all my time, all my life in something that is worthy. In other words, the only investment for me personally is Jesus Christ. The only investment that matters right now, if you are wise, if you are intelligent enough to realize that the only thing in life that matters today, I'm speaking, is Jesus. You begin to be wise and to understand. Why? 
Because look around you. A virus is coming, and no matter how much money you have, what happens? You will still be sick. Kings, presidents, they had the virus, they could die. Yes, of course. And tomorrow, maybe there will come another virus deadlier than this one. So no matter how much you earn, how much money you have, how, how healthy you are right now, um, it's, 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 it's coming after you. So uh, the only thing that remains and stays is Jesus. So if you invest all your efforts in that relationship, guess what? Well, he's coming soon. He, he is taking us home. And today we have happiness and joy, no matter what will happen. So right now you have the insurance that he's with you and you, differ, you live a different and, and beautiful quality life. And then also when he's coming. So I will strongly encourage all of you to invest in the only stock market, if you call it like this, which is Jesus. Um, it says in, in the scripture we just read, it says that um, we have confessed the good confession in the sight of many witnesses. Mm -hmm. So I've called myself Christian and I've confessed that I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. And now I must follow after righteousness, godliness, all these things. And to me, it means that I have to be born again. I have to have that heart transplant. I have to get rid of my heart mm -hmm. that's not necessarily godly or patient or gentle. And I have to ask Christ day by day, moment by moment, challenge by challenge to give me his heart, to take away my heart of stone and give me his heart of flesh. Mm -hmm. Because after I've confessed that that good confession, if I don't ask Christ for strength and help, I am not naturally godly, faithful. I'm not naturally loving. I'm not naturally patient or gentle. So every day as the Lord reveals where I need to be patient or where I need to be gentle, I need to ask him for his heart and his strength to help me to do these things. And so let's also um, skip down to verses 17 through 19. And it says, tell those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone, but their trust should be in living in the living God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give generously to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure and a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of real life. So for those who do aspire to be rich or that already are rich, that have that monetary wealth, what is the Bible really saying about that? Is it bad to be rich or how should we handle that, that entire? No, it's not, it's not bad to be rich um, because God has a, um, he has a job for the rich people to do. You know, so it's not bad to be rich. I, I think where the problem comes in is if they do not follow the admonition that Paul has given here in Timothy, then, because it's hard for some rich people to open their hands and let it go. So I think once they follow the charge he has given to the rich people in this present world, there is no problem with it. And they may even become richer. Not, they may not become necessarily richer in money, but they may become richer in joy and happiness with Jesus Christ and their walk. And I pray that someday he will charge me with all those riches. Amen. Amen. And I will be the second after you, Sister. <laughs> uh, but the, the topic is expert in errors. Many people today, they invest all their energy and efforts in providing and, and making riches and, and all. Uh, amounting and, and putting a lot of riches and, and money and millions, which is not which is not bad to have money, but if your focus is uh, those resources only because we are doses are bringing you happiness, look around you and you'll be disappointed. On the other side, there are scientists today who believe that uh, God doesn't exist. The world is created billions of billions of years. And they are investing the same, all the efforts, all the time. So you see, we have the time that we are investing right now 
Where do you invest your time? Where do you invest your resources? Where do you invest your money? Where do you invest your life? Everything. One day, if you do not invest in the right way, one of these may take you to may take you down. So one of these can be error, unless you go directly to God because God has never failed. So you see, no matter how intellectual capacity you have, if you do not put all of these intellectual capacities in and, and skills you have to the feet of Jesus Christ and not recognize him first about all of these, it's useless. Money, useless time. Many people today, they spend their time doing nothing. And this is why they have nothing. <laughs> because they are not spending their time in the quality time with Jesus Christ first, dedicating first his life, and then the, the time that he has. In other words, we have to be time, uh, the stewards, very good stewards of all the resources that God has given us. I was reading also yesterday from this book of Ellen G. White, and she said that all the resources that God has been giving us, if we do not use them appropriately for his kingdom, that's a sin. And I was astonished, wait a minute, yeah. If you have the possibility to invest in God and you are misusing your gifts to something that is not building for eternity, that's a sin. We cannot be lazy. We cannot, we cannot invest wrong. We cannot fail because we have to, and I'm speaking about failing about God, you know, we cannot, if we go and spend our time with Jesus, we will never be a failure, okay? Um, so yeah, we have to use all these resources. So can you be, um, what do you call it, um, expert in error? Yeah, we can be experts, but one day it will show us where the way, that way that we have chosen is taking us. All right, and let's also talk a little bit about Wednesday's lesson, which is foolishness and wisdom. So let's read Proverbs chapter one, verses one through seven. I have it. Okay. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the word of understanding, to receive instruction is wise dealing in righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young man, that the wise may hear and increase in learning, that the man of understanding may attain to sound counsel, to understand the proverb and parables, the words and riddles of the wise. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, but the foolish despise wisdom and instruction. My son, listen to your father's instruction and don't forsake your mother's teaching, for they will be a garland to grace your head and chains around your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, don't consent. Set to 10? I was saying to seven, seven, but we're good. At, oh. Where we started it. At, yes. We're good at 10. That actually worked, played into it well. So what is the true basis of Christian education? The knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. And when we look at this, this knowledge of God, that this wisdom that we're talking about here in Proverbs, what's the difference between foolishness and wisdom? And how can we use knowing the difference to avoid being foolish in today's world? Mm -hmm. um, everything, everything comes from God. He's the creator. And I think we become foolish when we attribute um, these things to anyone else but him. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to, um, there is um, this thing called the Fabianacci spiral where the, you see those sequences in nature mm -hmm. and um, he, he, where people say, oh, nature is showing us Fabianacci's numbers. Whereas is Fabianacci, Fabianacci who discovered or um, happened upon it that this sequence occurs, but it was already there in nature long before he even saw it. Mm -hmm. But now he's getting credit for seeing these things. Whereas God had created this and placed it there so that we know that 
he is creator and these things could not happen by happenstance, you know? And it's like um, evolution. You know, we, we, we talk about God creating and how he took time and he fashioned man and he set things in order because God is a God of law and order. He set things in order and he, he I think the, when the, you look at the original language in Genesis, it says he architected us, which means he built us up, structured us, put some thought and design into us. And you look at all this design in human beings, and then you want to think we came from cosmic ooze. Mm -hmm. You know, we when we take God out of it, our wisdom is foolish. You know, we build theories on a house of cards or shifting sand. And we, we bend things to make it fit our concept. Mm -hmm. But when you leave God in it, everything flows mm -hmm. in a perfect pattern. You know, because I remember um, reading when I was a kid, I'm still a kid. I remember reading that the, um, the stars make a song. You know, the, the universe is filled with music, inherent music. And then not so long ago, NASA discovered that the stars make a song, that there is music. But any Bible reader would have known a long time ago that God said that it, it makes a song. There's music in, in the universe. Yeah. So I think, um, so now they think they're so proud and good because they discovered that. Mm -hmm. Foolishness, because it was always there. God had said it was there. And, and the other point that, that I would like to complement what Heather said is the fact that Many people today, everything they build, all the scientists, all the signs that which is not building for God's character, for God's glory, it's foolishness. And we'll see the atomic bomb. Uh, we see how, how people, they put all of the energy in millions and billions of dollars to, to destroy the earth. We see how also, for instance, the satellites, uh, they are created for some other purposes. There are many junk satellites and some, some of them, they were created to destroy um, countries. So we see how scientists today, how human beings today use all this knowledge and they are foolish in the sense of using for mass destruction, using for against the humanity, using against themselves. But the wisdom of God, according to the Bible, is that the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the character of Jesus Christ, when you start um, studying God's character, and you discover Jesus Christ, you, you glorify uh, himself. And Isaac Newton, one of the scientists, who, according to uh, one of my friends, Arthur Taylor, said that uh, Isaac Newton is the head, is the scientist above all the other scientists. And he said very clearly that all his knowledge that he discovered was coming through prayer. Uh, so everything comes from God. So he's, if that scientist, the scientist, of our modern world also has acknowledged God as the root of all his wisdom and knowledge. Shouldn't we go there? Yeah. I think that too, I think that too comes, comes back to what you had asked to Crystal about something being beautiful, mm -hmm. but not necessarily good and holy. Because um, like the pastor said, you go and you, uh, you're doing yeah, science some scientific experiment and you come upon the, the nucleus of plutonium, mm. you know, if it's beautiful and it's boggling that all this energy is trapped in these little atoms. Um, and you may say, wow, we serve an awesome God, but then Satan is going to come and whisper into the ear about what you could do with it. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's where the beauty of it is mad with what we do with, with the things that we discover, mm. your mindset after that, because you know we want that power. We want to think that we have created or destroyed something. It's like um, what the Nazis did during the Holocaust with their experiments, you know, because it's good to say, well, um, you know, you see these traits in twins or you see these things going on, but what they did wasn't, beautiful mm -hmm. and so let's look at that um 
as we're talking about that beauty of holiness and our creator, because that's something else that we just talked about in this section a little bit. Let's look at Thursday's lesson where the Lord answered Job. And I think this is very straightforward um, and how he answered him. So let's look at Job chapter 38, verses four through 11. I would love to read the entire chapter of Job 38, but we don't have time today yeah. for that. Um, but I encourage everyone to read the entire chapter of Job 38. So it's doing Job 38 chapter uh, verses four through 11. I have it. Okay, go for it. Read it with a powerful voice. <laughs> um, I heard this read on Adventist in Odyssey one time and it's, it's amazing. And it says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who determined its measures, if you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Whereupon were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke out of the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, marked out for it my bungs, set bars and doors, and said, here you may come, but no further. Here you proud waves shall us be stayed. Mm -hmm. To what verse? Uh, to 11. Okay. So how does this give us a different view when it comes to arts and sciences? And what does this tell us about God as our creator and who we are as his creation? We serve an awesome, powerful God. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> we, we are quite um, full of ourselves mm -hmm. when we think we know what we know. You know, because I, I'm, I'm pretty sure when Jesus comes, a lot of things we took for granted we look back at it and see how stupid we were. It's not even close to what it was because I have seen science evolved in my lifetime, what we thought we knew and what we know now, even with this Corona thing going on, what we think we knew in the beginning and what we think we know now. But I think um, we, we can't even tell, like he said <laughs> um, in, in this thing that we, cause this was God talking. You know, can you tell, can you tell how he laid the foundations of the earth before we thought we were riding on the back of a turtle, <laughs> you know, um, but I, it just tells you what a powerful, awesome God we serve and how much he has put thought and design into giving us this world, showing himself through nature, showing himself through um, the things of this world so that we cannot say there is no God and that he doesn't care for us. I was, thank you so much, Heather, and you're right. I was watching a, um, a documentary on YouTube. Um, it is, it's called The Origin of Life. And there are all the brilliant minds of this world at this moment, you know, so-called brilliant minds, sorry. And there were all these scientists, the heads of the department of, of uh, uh, anatomy, of geology, or all of them, they were the heads of that, the, from Oxford, from Harvard, from all of these universities, and, and a huge table. And everybody was giving his opinion about the origin of life. But none of them was pointing to a resolution. Nobody knew where this coming. Everybody was confused. One gentleman said, I don't know if he was an atheist or, 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 or a creationist. Uh, he said, the original life is coming from millions of uh, human uh, of DNAs. We don't have any tree of life, as, as, the, as the evolution says right now. And Richard Dawkins on the other side said, so are you telling me that I was wrong? All of it, the original of life is not coming from a, 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 a small molecule and, and a tree of life? No, he said. We are... These are bushes of life. There are 12,000, yeah, 12,000 uh, DNAs that they cannot match between themselves. So they are coming, boom, existing from once. So he was a marine a geologist. Now you see, when all of these scientists, they try to believe, they try to explain something, they cannot. 
how the world started, where the life, where the light has come. The light cannot be, the energy cannot be created. How did it came to existence? If you believe in the, in the Big Bang, so when you look at all the complexity, and Jesus asked very clear uh, uh, in the book of Job, where were you when I created all of this? When you look on Jesus Christ, you have all the time questions, the human being has questions that will never ever be able to answer now, nor in eternity. And this is why we love God, because God has the answer and we will study for eternity all of these things. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Heather. Uh, no, I was going to say, um, I believe when God said, let there be in the beginning in Genesis, because his word has so much power and life in it. Yes. That's when he said, let there be. Amen. Everything sprang forth and it made a big banging noise. <laughs> <laughs> because it couldn't, it couldn't come forth gently. When he said, let there be, it had to come forth quickly. Because so That's, that's your big bang theory, Heather. Yeah. It was, it was the command of God and the obedience of nature. <laughs> Amen. So, yeah, all the scientists, all this foolishness, all these questions that scientists today, they have, and they are sincere. They are finding, and many of them are right now coming to the knowledge of God. Many of them, they are coming to understand that there is a, hum there is a supreme being, a designer, mm -hmm. a perfect designer, that he created all of these things. Uh, so yeah, Job's questions are uh, practically Job answer. He said practically, uh, he said, I, I keep my mouth shut. Yeah, after that, you can't say anything. <laughs> How can you answer that knowledge? That and that's, that's just a piece of what he said in chapter 30. I mean, continue, it goes on and on and on. And you're just like, nope, yeah. not touch. <laughs> I, was, I was talking to a, 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 a physician. He is a genius. And uh, she is a, a, the chemistry major. She's in Harvard, if I'm not wrong, right now, or Yale. I don't, I, I don't remember where it is. So she was, I think, the, the first place in the world in the Olympics of chemistry. She, she won that place. And she's, she's a brilliant mind. In Harvard, now she was reading uh, 80 or 100 pages. She, she's amazing. And I asked her, she was an atheist. I asked her, how can you explain the Bombardier Bureau? How, how can you explain that little bug? You know, the Bombardier beetle. The Bombardier beetle, as you know very well, has two chemical substances. Yeah. But uh, a thin, a thin, how do you call it, divided by a thin layer, yeah. A membrane. Membrane. And when they're coming out, when an animal is attacking, an insect is attacking it, when both of them, they join together, creates a big boom, a big bomb that, that hits the, the, what the spider or whatever is attacking. So how do you explain, how the evolution explains that? There is no answer. Go by internet and you have no answer. And she was puzzled because she knew what was I was talking. And then we began to share Jesus Christ. After a few hours, she accepted Jesus Christ. You see, scientists, a little big, a little bug, a small bug cannot explain. And Jesus says very clearly, how can you explain what I have created? How the rain comes from and how all the sick, all the things are, are, are coming to existence. So we have no answer. I am so happy that God is so wide and so wise that, uh, that uh, he can share with us a little bit about his wisdom. So let us all study it more. So for our wrap up question, I'm gonna go back to, um, I believe that was Wednesday's lesson called Experts in Error. And Pastor was starting to touch on this a little bit. But the question I have is, how can someone be rich in knowledge and still be foolish. Mm. And it's kind of where you were just going, Pastor, with the, the scientists there. Mm -hmm. When people believe that they are the source of intelligence and wisdom, they are the one to be led astray. Satan has been deceived us. And the problem starts from Genesis chapter 3, when Satan said to a woman and also to Adam, you will be like God. Human beings, they want to be like God. They want to prove. They want to live for eternity. I was uh, studying the mythology, the Greek mythology, the Babylonian mythology, and the Roman mythology. But the oldest mythology, the Sumerian or, or, or Babylonian mythology, they speak about how Gilgamesh, for instance, 
how the individuals are desired to live forever. They put the, uh, they, they create statues, say they, they, they have many children. Uh, why? Because in our heart is a desire to be, to live eternity, to live for eternity. God has put that desire in our hearts. But when individuals try to seek that eternity uh, in the other point, and they look at themselves, they begin to be God. They create themselves as gods. And when you create yourself God, and throughout the history, the presidents, the kings, the Egyptians, and many, they were considered themselves as God. Why? Because they, they know something. So when people they, when they have knowledge, and in the, in the 15th, 16th century came the humanism, then the reason came, the illumination came. In other words, this philosophy that you know, that you are the best, you become like God. So that's a deception. Satan is trying to mix the knowledge with that, that desire to be like God. So I think, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, a, a temptation for every single individual who believes that he is intelligent to believe that he's by his own mind, his own uh, brain, his own reasons. So it's, it's a very, very um, tempting, um, uh, how do you call it, a thin line to be that you have the money is because of your power. You have the knowledge is because of you. You have your family and everything is because of you. And when you realize that everything has been taken from you, you have nothing left. So many people will be, will be on this error, will be disappointed by their choice. And hopefully many of them will come to Christ sooner to realize that only in Christ you can be intelligent. Only in Christ you can be wise. Only in Christ you can have something. All right, any other comments on that question? All right, so we will wrap up our Sabbath school lesson for this morning. And I thank you both Heather and Pastor Stoyan for um, your comments and, and adding to the fullness of the Sabbath school lesson that we had this week. Um, next week, we will be studying the Christian and work. So that should be interesting as well. Um, so we will have our closing prayer by Sister Heather. So she gives. Okay, let's pray. Thank you. Almighty Heavenly Father, how wonderful and marvelous you are, Lord. You have made such a beautiful world that we could still live in it and see your glory and see your unfathomable love. See the care you have for us. And we thank you and praise your name, Lord. We ask you please to give each and every one of us wisdom and understanding, even those who are listening, Lord. Wisdom and understanding of your word so that we could live by it, so that we could know you and be wise, so that we could share it with others, so that those who are lost, those who are searching, those who are still trying to decide will take hold of that hand you have outstretched, offering them eternity and be saved. Lord, may we apply your words in our lives. We ask you please to give us your heart so that we could hear your voice and be led by you. Mm -hmm. It's my prayer in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you for that closing prayer. Okay. And thank you all for joining us this Sabbath at, for our Sabbath school. We will see you back here next week for our, our lesson. Thank you and have a wonderful Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.